from the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. In the United States alone, doctors have performed over 8,000 organ and tissue transplants just since the start of this year. Yet the imbalance between the supply of organs for transplant and the demand for them can be staggering. About 75,000 people are active on the national waiting list for an organ transplant right now, and on average 20 people die each day. Now, globally, the situation is even worse. The international shortage of transplantable organs has led to a booming underground industry known as the red market, where people illegally buy and sell human body parts to the highest bidder. Now, horror stories associated with the red market will sometimes catch international headlines, like the 2013 case of a young boy in China who had his eyes stolen, likely for the use of his corneas. But day to day, the red market operates like a business. Many people desperate for cash will offer organs like a kidney to brokers willing to pay a lofty price, sometimes over $5,000. But it's those handling the deal who really bring in the money. Someone in need of a transplant may pay tens of thousands of dollars for that same kidney, leading to a huge profit for traffickers. Now, by some estimates, around 10% of all transplanted organs globally come from the red market. So on this edition of Global Journalist, we're looking at how this shortage of organ donors has ballooned into a lucrative underground market and how efforts to squash it are shaping international policy. In a few minutes, we'll hear from people with knowledge of different aspects of this trade. We'll start with Campbell Fraser in Brisbane, Australia. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of International Business and Asian Studies at Griffith University who researches the organ trade. He's also a transplant recipient himself. Campbell, welcome. Oh, great. Great to be with you. Give us just a quick overview as to how the legal organ donation system works in most countries. Well, there's there's basically two individual systems. There are countries that have a deceased donation model where there is a waiting list for organs for people who are waiting for a transplant. Uh, in countries like the US, uh, here in Australia, most of Western Europe. And in those situations, a patient may wait three, four, sometimes five years for an organ for transplantation. That deceased organ donation is backed up by a live donor program. So if somebody who's in need of a kidney has a loved one or a close friend who's willing to donate an organ to them, then a live donation may occur if there is compatibility with the donor and recipient and both are, are, are healthy enough to do that. So really in, in you know the Western developed countries, it's primarily a deceased donation system backed up by a live donation system. And this is uh, these are incredibly, at least in the United States, incredibly expensive operations. A heart transplant Certainly. operation can cost uh, more than a million dollars. A kidney transplant operation can cost something like $415,000. But the yes. actual cost mm-hmm. of the organ is not really a significant part of that. That's true, true. One of, one of the basic principles of deceased organ donation is that no money is changing hands for that organ. What you're paying for, you're paying for the hospital fees, the surgeon fees, the medication, the follow-up treatment. In transplantation, it's actually the follow-up treatment is the main cost. The surgery is just one of many steps in bringing someone back to good health. I mean, it can take, you know, three to four months after the transplant for health to be restored. So, you know, it's a long drawn out process, therefore extremely expensive. And Campbell Fraser, you mentioned that the wait times can be very long. And so some people may look to sort of the informal market to buy a kidney if they think they may die before they get one through the legal route. So how how do people access this sort of red market of organs? The patients who decide after maybe they've been waiting a few years, or alternatively, patients who are in developing countries where there's no deceased donation system available. So for some patients in countries that don't have deceased donation, then buying an organ is actually their only real option. So what happens in those situations is that there's this patient-to-patient network where 
if somebody has purchased an organ on the black market, they will share that information with other people who are looking for an organ. And this is what we're really seeing now in a really in the last three to four years is like Facebook discussion groups, patient to patient networks. And that is how patients are now learning of the opportunities to receive an organ in, on the black market. In the past, before we had a number of crackdowns on this, you could you could find organs being openly advertised on on sale on on bulletin boards in newspapers. Now it's it's moved underground. So what's what we're seeing now is it's all going online. Social media is now the principal way that a patient would find out how to find that organ. So what would happen is somebody goes to an, one of these countries obtains an organ when they come back they can themselves often become brokers themselves because what happens is the patient will say go to a country where these illegal transplants happen for example at the moment Egypt is is a major country where that's happening and the broker will tell that person who's buying the organ well if you go back to your home country and you can find me more patients I'll give you a 10% commission. Now, if I have just spent 100,000, 110,000 US dollars is about the going rate at the moment, then I'm going to be feeling pretty poor. I may have mortgaged my house. I may have taken loans. I may have borrowed money from, from friends and relatives. So if I can find more patients to send there, then I'm going to get my money back. So it's kind of working in this scheme now of patient to patient network. So that's well, that's Campbell, how well, Campbell, you, find about you did mention and our time does grow short, but you did mention Egypt and one of the hotspots actually as a source country for organs yep. that are sold uh, sure. is Syrian refugees. And so Correct. I understand you've spent some time interviewing uh, people who have traveled to get organs donated by people fleeing the war uh, in Syria. Tell us just briefly about that. One of the really interesting things about the organ trade is world events dictate where donors are coming from. So we, Egypt has, has for many years been a problematic country because there are a number of doctors there that have the expertise to perform transplants, but there's very poor regulatory oversight. So what, is, what has been happening is that refugees from other countries are heading to Egypt in order to sell an organ. So what happens with the Syrian refugees? They're going across the border into Lebanon. Uh, they end up, ultimately, they're looking to get to Europe, but they've run out of money. The people traffickers are asking for more money. So therefore, as a way of raising that money, they're lured into meeting the brokers who are offering them maybe two and a half thousand, three thousand dollars for a kidney, which they will then travel to Egypt and have that organ removed. So that's that's the basic mechanics of how that happens. But what the real sad part of this is, yes, they do get the money for the organ. Often they get a lot less than they've originally been promised. But because of the really crude surgical methods that are used in the removal of that organ, they have lifelong disability, chronic pain, often really horrific infections. And from that, they're just no, no longer strong enough to continue that journey. So what I have seen are a number of people who, who tried to make that migration journey, but the sale of the kidney has left them with permanent disability, permanent disfigurement. Well, and that's really the end of the journey for them. They, they end up getting stuck there in Egypt, also seeing patients coming through, uh, the sellers coming through uh, Libya as well. They were in refugee camps in Libya and coming into Egypt, and then they end up just stuck there. Well, Campbell, so, Campbell Fraser, I'm sorry, we're, we're just out of time, but thanks so much sure. for taking the time to join us. My pleasure.
A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. On today's program, we're talking about the international shortage of human organs needed to perform transplants. Now, one country, Iran, has taken a different approach. It's the only nation in the world that lets people legally sell organs like their kidneys. Here to talk with us about Iran's government-regulated marketplace for organs and human tissues is Shashank Bengali. He's the South Asia correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. He's reported on issues with the organ shortages from Iran as well as from India. Shashank, welcome. Hey, good to be with you. Well, talk to us just about uh, the approach that Iran has taken in addressing a shortage of transplantable organs. So as you said, Iran is the only country in the world uh, that offers people a legal way uh, to sell their their organs and their kidneys, and it's the only uh, place where this is done. There's a, a government foundation. Um, it registers buyers and sellers. It matches them up. Uh, it sets a fixed price, which last year was about $4,600 uh, per organ. Um, and in the last 25 years, uh, they've performed about 30,000 uh, kidney transplants this way. And, and the Iranian authorities say this is a humane way uh, for people who need uh, kidneys to receive them in a, in a clear, transparent system. And for people who want to part with a, a non-vital organ, uh, it's a way for them to, uh, to do so in a way that's safe. Um, however, what we learned when we went to Tehran uh, last year was that the system doesn't always work quite so cleanly. Um, you know, there's a fixed price, but sellers have learned that they can cut side deals uh, to make thousands of dollars more uh, from uh, from eager uh, buyers. Um, and there's also uh, been a number of stories in the Iranian press um, about doctors who have been caught uh, performing uh, transplants for foreigners, uh, usually Saudi Arabians, um, on fake IDs. Um, fake Iranian IDs. And um, I think and from your reporting, you showed that, uh, you know, as you discussed, there's this black market, but you said people actually hang flyers in the street advertising their kidneys. And so it seemed like one of the ways you found would be kidney donors was just by responding to these ads that are posted in the street. Well, this is one of the amazing things. If you go to some of the main kidney hospitals uh, in Tehran, you'll see these uh, these flyers plastered everywhere. Uh, you know, it's basically, you know, like guitar lessons, uh, you know, on a street corner in Brooklyn, th those flyers where you just kind of pull off a, uh, a sticker with the, with the phone number on it. This is the same way people are advertising their kidneys for sale. Now, it's not clear if any people are actually selling kidneys in this way. The government says that they don't um, uh, take any of those uh, sellers and add them to the system, to, to, the, to the official system. However, what it does show is that there is a huge amount of desperation. You know, Campbell mentioned uh, that uh, world events and, and news events drive uh, uh, many of the trends in, in uh, organ sales. And in Iran, it's no different. I mean, this is a country that's suffering from severe economic hardship, uh, years of economic sanctions, um, and uh, corruption and unemployment and people uh, who we met, uh, these are folks who are in bankruptcy, uh, who've lost their jobs, lost their businesses. They're looking for ways to earn uh, a quick uh, a quick buck and, and they're trying and, to sell their kidneys. And so from the perspective of the people who need a transplant, does the Iranian system work well for them? Well, it really depends. Uh, you know, Iran says that, that they've done away with, with the wait list uh, by setting things up uh, in this system. But actually, we learned that um, you still have to wait up, up to a year, sometimes longer, uh, to get a transplant in Iran. Uh, there are uh, certainly people who have, who have gotten uh, kidneys in this way and who are perfectly happy that the transplants, as far as uh, we've understood, are performed uh, in, in proper hospitals under safe conditions. Um, and, uh, you know, those who are, uh, those who are matched up, uh, are, are often quite pleased. Um, but as we, as we learned, you know, there's uh, still this black market out there and, uh, it's not very clear that Iranian authorities have a great grasp of what's happening, particularly in outlying provinces beyond the capital, uh, where th there could be, uh, illicit, uh, operations happening, uh, away from, from their scrutiny. And Shishank, before I let you go, I wanted to touch on your reporting in India. You wrote a story about a young man who sort of blew the whistle on an organ theft scheme, it seemed like there. Talk to us just about that. Well, so India is quite interesting, too, uh, because of changing diets and, and sort of increasing prosperity in India. Um, there's a, a huge uh, 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 incidence of diabetes, and that's one of the, the reasons why people require uh, kidney transplants if things get to an advanced stage. And India... 
unlike the U.S., doesn't have um, a, uh, a system uh, or harvest, actually, I should say, very, very few uh, organs from uh, deceased donors. So the vast majority of transplants are done in India through living donors. Um, and because of, of uh, you know, the government's desire to crack down on uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of make this process more transparent. They've they've passed laws that say that only close relatives can um, uh, can donate kidneys and other organs in rare exceptions. Um, and this has given rise to a whole uh, uh, problem of forged documents inside hospitals. And every year or two, there's a, a quote unquote kidney scam. Um, at a hospital, we covered one two years ago at one of the biggest hospitals in Mumbai. Uh, where a dozen uh, medical staff were arrested for uh, participating in a, a system that was forging documents um, uh, to get uh, kidneys from unrelated donors um, and recipients. Um, and this happens every so often, and you know it's because there's a massive supply and demand uh, problem. Uh, you know, Indians. The, the research suggests that about 220,000 Indians need kidneys, and India performs only about 8,000 transplants a year. So it's just a, a numbers game. Well, Shishank Bengali, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. To broaden our discussion on the organ trade, we're joined now by Dominique Martin, a senior lecturer in health ethics at Deakin University in Melbourne. She spent 10 years researching solutions to organ trafficking and transplant tourism. Also joining us is Brendan Parent. He's the director of applied bioethics at, M at New York University's School of Professional Studies, where he focuses on ethical issues regarding transplant medicine. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Dominique Martin, uh, I'll go to you first. Tell us uh, what sorts of international conventions are there governing this uh, trade in uh, in kidneys and other organs? Probably the most important one is the World Health Organization's Guiding Principles on Human Cell Tissue and Organ Transplantation. That's a document that was uh, first introduced in very early 90, uh, 1990s in response to growing concern about a burgeoning organ market around the world. Those principles really articulated the standards that the international community of transplant professionals, health authorities, feels um, should govern all of our practices in donation and transplantation. And although those principles have been revised regularly throughout the years, the basic tenets remain the same. And those principles have then been picked up in other documents, in particular the Declaration of Istanbul against organ trafficking and transplant tourism, which was uh, first published about 10 years ago uh, this year. Um, and yeah, they would be, I guess, two of the, the really important ones, but we've had other organizations, the World Medical Association, and then at the regional level, the Council of Europe uh, has a convention. And really around the world, many countries have put together statements, uh, really, which set forth the same standards and the opposition to trafficking. Well, Brendan Parent, you heard uh, Shishank Bengali describing the marketplace in Iran, and he mentioned that there are some problems with how that market functions. But in theory, if a market like that, it didn't have some of the operational problems that Shishank described, what, what are some, are there some ethical problems with paying donors to give their kidney? Sure. With human organs, they are inelastic goods, right? I mean, this is uh, a, a problem of, of coercion that uh, people who are going to consider selling their organs generally don't have money for basic needs. And they're going to be offered sums which are far greater than the amount they're used to. So the choice isn't really a real choice. Well, Dominique Martin, if you could pick up on that point, then do you also see this as problematic then? I mean, Iran would say, look, we've eliminated the wait times for uh, transplant recipients. In other words, uh, people aren't dying waiting for organs anymore. Uh, I completely agree with Brendan there, and I think the evidence from around the world shows that the people who do sell, by and large, are people in desperate circumstances who are exploited and or coerced. Um, from a more practical perspective, uh, I would say it's very important also to point out that the Iranian system has not been successful, that the claims that they've eliminated the waiting list have been disproven. And another country, in fact, that for some years has been paying up to 15,000 US dollars for not just a living donor, but also for a deceased uh, organ donor, 
is Saudi Arabia, and they've also they've got very big waiting lists. Um, they haven't increased their rates despite increasing prices or, or increasing offers to people. So it also just doesn't work. There aren't either that many desperate people or it's it's not going to be the most effective solution to the organ shortage. Well, and Brendan, how difficult is it to enforce sort of rules against people traveling from one country to another to receive an organ? I mean, is that could you be arrested for traveling from the United States or from another country to a place like Egypt to purchase an organ and have it transplanted there? Ostensibly, uh, you know, this is definitely violations of, of human rights and the, the various protocols that uh, Dominique mentioned are in place, but it's incredibly difficult to track and enforce. Uh, this takes place completely underground. So being able to actually find the uh, perpetrators, the brokers, the recruiters is incredibly difficult. What is the organization or the oversight body that's actually going to do uh, the enforcement or the punishment? It's just not there. Well, Dominique, one of the countries that has sort of an interesting role in this is China, which has come under a lot of international criticism for alleged use of uh, organs, or, uh, organs. I guess you couldn't call them donated organs from prisoners who have been executed in Chinese prisons for transplant process. What, what do we know about this? How widespread was it? Is it still happening now? So this was certainly widespread in China. That was uh, China's method uh, for procuring organs for transplantation for several years. Um, under pressure from the international community, uh, obviously this is a, a huge violation of human rights. That policy and that practice uh, has been uh, rescinded in recent years, and China's uh, been working very hard to develop a new ethical uh, program of donation more consistent with international standards. But certainly that was the primary uh, source of organs in China, and China was for several years a primary destination for people going to receive um, organs uh, that had been taken from executed prisoners. And Brendan Perrin, if we could just return to the ethics of it again, because, uh, you know, Campbell Fraser raised this interesting scenario where you have very desperate people coming from Syria now who have become a major source of organs uh, and people traveling to the Middle East to obtain organs from them. How is this particularly problematic? I mean, on some level, the people the, he mentioned that some of these donors are looking to get to Europe. They have no other way to get there. The people who receive the organ may have no other way to live. I don't hold this against either the potential donor or the recipient. Uh, if this was my mother or your sister, right, you would do anything to get them the organ. Uh, so this this isn't a problem of personal responsibility, but the policy has to has to control it. Uh, this uh, people are, are getting harmed in incredible ways. Both the donor and the recipient in these underground markets are not getting the care they need and end up with far worse outcomes than legitimate systems. So we need other solutions. And you know what those other solutions are? We need uh, everyone who's listening to this interview to go register as an organ donor right now, as a deceased donor. We need living donors to be adequately compensated for their follow-up care, for their travel, and for other expenses. Well, Dominique Martin, let me throw this to you then. Brendan Parent mentioned uh, the importance of registering as, uh, as a deceased organ donor. I myself am registered as a donor. But I understand in the United States, for example, there's something like 100 million people who have registered as organ donors, which is basically a third of the population. And yet there's still this huge list of people waiting for transplants. So it doesn't seem like purely getting organs from deceased donors is going to be able to resolve this problem. So it's, it's a complex problem, what we might call a, a wicked problem. Uh, the registrations obviously in the US are fantastic, but it is still a really rare opportunity for someone to die in circumstances where they could donate their organs for transplantation. That's something that's being worked on currently, so creating more opportunities, having, for example, uh, people who can donate after they die uh, in a manner where their heart stops, but they're not brain dead, which is you know what we've sort of traditionally thought of as the primary source of um, donated organs from the deceased. So I guess new models uh, of organ procurement uh, from people when they die. New things that uh, we can do with organs that have been recovered from donors, but in previous years would not have been suitable for transplantation. So being able to take um, hearts, livers, uh, lungs even, 
that weren't perhaps ready to use, but putting them on machines where they can be repaired, so to speak, um, restored to a, a quality that then can be used successfully in transplantation. So we can get more out of the opportunities that we have for deceased donation. But definitely, as Brendan said, removing the barriers to living donation, often the financial barriers or the social barriers, lack of knowledge about opportunities uh, to become a living donor. And then a whole range of um, particular methods, which uh, I don't know if we, we want to go into the detail about other methods, but maybe a key point to mention is also prevention. As I think Shashank said, um, many of those needs for organ transplantation are the result of preventable diseases. So if we look after people with diabetes, hypertension, we address obesity issues, we're going to have fewer people progressing, developing kidney failure, and then ultimately needing a transplant. So not just waiting to spend all the money on the high-tech, high-cost transplantation, but working at the prevention end as well. Well... Brendan Dominique mentioned a number of different potential solutions here. How how would we get some of these methods to developing nations? I mean, it's one thing for some of these systems to be changed uh, in industrialized countries with sophisticated health systems, quite another to do them in much poorer countries. That's true. We have to get the governments on board. They need to understand that this is a priority for their population. Get education into the schools about the importance of organ donation so that the next generation prioritizes registration as a deceased donor. Uh, uh, improve the social determinants of health, as Dominique mentions. Make sure we prioritize uh, healthy diets and adequate access to good food so that we can prevent diabetes earlier. Um, make sure that these countries invest in new technologies so that in 20 years we'll actually be able to 3D print organs uh, that will be perfect replicas of those that were damaged or lost for an individual. Well, Dominique Martin, you heard Brendan Parent talk about the use of 3D printing. There are a number of promising technologies, it sounds like, that may change this debate. I understand that the use of stem cells is allowing the creation of potentially matchable organs. We've seen, I believe, an organ transplant from a pig to a human being already. Where do you see this debate moving over the next decade or two? Probably a, a scientist is the right person to, to question about that, but certainly there are really promising signs in a, in a lot of different fields. So I think... I certainly couldn't put a, a date on it, but I think in 10 years' time, we're going to have, again, a lot more opportunities, a lot more alternatives, and hopefully see really some action in terms of preventing and finding solutions that don't require transplants. And Brendan Parent, last word for you. Are you optimistic that uh, 10 years from now, we'll still be looking at a situation where 20 people a day are dying on, on wait lists for organ transplants? I'm an eternal optimist, an optimistic ethicist. I actually do believe that we will see a difference. And... Uh, we will look back on today and shake our heads at this grotesque practice um, because uh, now everybody has uh, organs that don't cause ethical issues that are able to be implanted and uh, ensure quality life for many more years. Well, we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Brendan Parent, Dominique Martin, Shishank Bengali, and Campbell Frazier for joining us. Our assistant producers this week are Taylor Campbell and Blythe Nebaker. Lauren Wortman is our supervising producer. Juwan Choi is visual editor. Aaron Hay is audio engineer, and Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.